So um, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers, all of you, for the invitation. It's, it was great hearing this morning how the whole project is going on, and um, I would really keep my fingers crossed that um, you and we will, will reach uh, what we aim for. So when Olivier asked me first, he said, well, let's talk about gray zones and the guidelines that was later changed uh, into conservative management of your life years, but I kept the gray zones because there are really some topics where we always struggle when we compose guidelines um, that we have no real evidence what to do. And I would like to start with imaging because imaging is in a way the um, start for the diagnosis um, of a stone. And um, in our current EAU guidelines, um, something is recommended, um, which sounds easy in, the, in Europe. I think in the States it's a bit different sometimes. So for us, ultrasound, we have a long tradition of ultrasound diagnosis, the first step. But then there was a shift in the last 10 years from um, conventional imaging, um, IVP, to non-contrast enhanced um, computer tomography in patients with acute flank pain, but as well um, in follow-up. Um, what do we have to know when we compare ultrasound with computer tomography? We should be aware that there are differences, of course. Um, Ureteral stones are often difficult to visualize with ultrasound, but if so, we have to know that there are differences in the sizes that we get out of the measurement with ultrasound or with CT. And as you see here in this study published um, in the last year, the small stones are estimated too small and the largest too big with ultrasound. And that is something which is important because if we talk about conservative management versus intervention for ureteral stones, for example, we often discuss about the size and um, it's often around five millimeters where we think, well, we should either go for intervention or for conven or for conservative um, observation. So it's important that we know the size of the stone. If you do a conventional NCCT, um, and if you measure the stone, like here, a pre stone, in the standard soft tissue window, what you get here is a 7.5 millimeter stone. If you change the window into pulmonary window or into a bone window, you get different sizes. And if we just go back, we had 7.5 millimeters here, and we have 4 millimeters here. And that is exactly around the 5 millimeters where we think, well, we should wait or we should go forward for intervention. And that illustrates um, there are drawbacks. What we have done, and others did as well, we have completely shifted to the bone window because we did ex vivo studies where we could demonstrate that the bone window, which is not surprising, in fact, um, correlates better with the real stone size um, than the other windows. Interestingly, you get different results if you let different um, specialist, uh, specialists um, measure your stone. And there's no nephrologist. Maybe you get a third size if you ask a nephrologist. Um, interestingly, um, the urologists um, determined different stone sizes, and that had an impact um, based on the AOA guidelines um, into where you group the stone size, and again, that had an impact on the decision into which um, treatment um, you go for. When, we, when CT came up, um, well, roughly 20 years ago now, there was a lot of discussion about radiation, and we always thought, well, the KUB and the IUB has significantly less um, radiation than a CT. That is true if you refer to a standard CT, as we do for abdominal evaluation. If you reduce the stone, uh, the, the radiation dose at which you can be for stone detection, um, as you see here, it's not much different to a standard IVP. That is what is published. It's always interesting to know what is real life, what happens in your hospital. And four years ago, I asked our radiologists to give me the data of the last 20 so-called low-dose CTs that they have done. And as you see here, there's hardly any low-dose CT. There are several reasons for that. First, they never really cared. Um, second, they were not aware that they can reduce um, the dosage Third, there were patients being obese, so they automatically increase um, the dosage. And just to illustrate that it works if you talk together, not be only between nephrologists and urologists, but as well to your radiologist, 
Um, I asked them two weeks ago to give me the numbers again. And it's a snapshot, of course, um, but it illustrates that something happened. And I was just really glad to see, however, there are still patients uh, with up to six millisieverts, still not really um, low dose. So that is one thing that we have to know when we do CT imaging for stones. What we have to be aware of is, in contrast to the standard IVP we did in the past, we have absolutely no information about the anatomy of the renal collecting system, and we have no information about function, um, what we had with standard contrast imaging. And the problem that we face when we look into the guidelines is that a contrast study um, is required if you decide um, that the patient should undergo any kind of treatment. And the question is, how can you do this? I think some people just do then a contrast CT, some do an IVP. What we often do is when we um, have a patient undergoing uteroscopy, that we tell the patient um, that we will do a, um, um, a retrograde contrast study first. And if something shows up that would change the concept, the patient is counseled about that. But there are different ways, but you should be aware that that is definitely a need. And I think at least the urologists here in the room know those patients having undergone several shockwave lithotripsy approaches without any effect. And when you then do a flexible endoscopy, you realize there is no stone. The stone is in the parenchyma, and it's quite difficult to visualize this, if not impossible, just from a um, non-enhanced CT. So there are several weaknesses of um, the standard CT for stones. It's obesity, especially if you're not only in terms of the radiation exposure as well, um, if you have distal pre-vesicle stones, and especially in the obese patients, it's often very difficult, if not impossible, to distinguish such stones from flebolites, from other um, calcifications. In the pelvis, we have no, as I said, information about function, nothing about the morphology. And the question is, how do we follow up patients who are under surveillance or um, observational um, measures? Do we do repeated CTs, again, with a lot of radiation? Can we switch from a CT to a plain X-ray, a KUB? We just don't know. And um, I think that is something we really have to evaluate in the future. If you do CTs for whatever reason, we often find incidental stones like here, and um, we, well, have to discuss with the patient the finding and, and what we have to do. That is a radiology paper that just evaluated 5,000 CTs for whatever reason, and they found a lot of stones, as you see here. Um, most of them were very small, up to three millimeters. Such stones probably don't need any treatment. The question is, do they need any follow-up? What happens with stones if we observe? And as you see in this paper, there's a difference between the anatomy. The lower pole usually causes less symptoms, less problems um, in follow-up than other um, locations um, within the renal collecting system. But as you see, something happens. So if you look at this survival curve, which means um, the time until the patient has any kind of symptoms, colic, spontaneous passage and intervention, um, it decreases. And that is what you can find in most of the few papers evaluating this. Um, roughly one third of your patients will have symptoms within the next five, six years. Um, up to 20% require intervention, some of them will have spontaneous passage. And I think that is something that may help the patient to decide if he wants observation or depending what he does professionally or if he well, wants to walk through the Antarctic or whatever. And um, then he undergoes um, preventive um, a procedure. As I said, the stone location has an impact. Um, lower pole stones rarely cause symptoms compared to non-lower pole stones and usually they don't pass spontaneously. And when I was a young resident in urology, I thought every stone has to be treated. And after having seen some patients um, in my office with a stone since 20, 30 years without any symptoms, it, it's clear. Um, I think they need observation, but it's, they do not necessarily need treatment. 
What is important when you counsel a patient for surveillance? It's the stone volume, of course. If you have a large stone, the patient should probably undergo treatment, even if he has no symptoms at this time. And the, if you want to call it the velocity, like you call it, discuss the PSA in urology, the stone grows. If the stone size um, increases with time, the risk of adverse effects is higher. And interestingly, this risk, um, the risk of symptoms, is even higher if you have younger patients, younger than 50 years. So these are all factors um, you may take into account when you um, discuss with a patient what to do with such an incidental renal stone. What is recommended in the EAU guidelines is mainly expert opinion. There is not much, if anything, um, in the literature. So we recommend periodically follow-up, um, initially twice a year, then yearly. And if you realize that symptoms come up, um, if the stone size changes, um, then the time for intervention might have come. De novo obstruction, associated infection or um, pain, of course. Um, I mentioned a lot of time guidelines, and I think it's important that we realize, um, apart from stones, what is a guideline, and often we do not know this. So, what is a guideline? A guideline is usually, it should be systematically developed. Uh, it's an evidence-based recommendation. I know it's a little detour, but I think it's important for the next point we discuss. Um, it displays the current state of the art, and has it legal implications? Well, yes and no. It's not a legally binding document. They are for guidance, as the name implies. Um, they are not very good for individualizing care. Though the AUA always talks about the index patient. Um, if you do not follow a guideline, which is possible, you have to justify this if it comes um, to um, a legal issue. Um, if you systematically do not follow guidelines, you're probably unwise. That is something you've got to know. So guidelines are evidence-based, and the evidence, as you know, is usually um, classified after the Oxford EBM classification, and you have the highly ranked 1B randomized trials, and above this, there are the systematic reviews um, where meta-analysis um, are done out of the randomized clinical trials. So that is the highest level we can get. And that is exactly what we do with the EAU. We have just published um, the steps how we perform systematic reviews to create guidelines. And the question is, if you think about evidence, sometimes evidence looks very clear. And in the next step, you have to ask yourself if you can trust the evidence. And if you go into the literature and if you deal with guidelines creation, um, you are sometimes really disappointed because um, that is a citation. 90% um, of what is published in the scientific literature is often unreliable, unfit to trigger any change of a clinical practice guideline. Um, and it's clear guidelines can only be as good as the available evidence. And a guy from, um, from Stanford University have, has published a lot on this mass production of redundant, misleading, syst conflicted, systematic reviews. And it's quite interesting, and those of you are, who are reviewers for research journals may be aware of this, how the number of systematic reviews has increased um, tremendously in the last 10 years. And I personally believe it's because it's just if you know um, the methodology, you can multiply your publications. And interestingly, a lot of them come out of China. And what um, this um, guy Ioannidis from, from Stanford said, the EBM has been hijacked. Influential RCTs, 1B, are largely done by or and for the benefit of the industry. And the guidelines and meta-analysis became a factory um, serving vested interests. And now we are coming back to stones because that is important um, to be aware of these problems when we discuss the conservative management of ureteral stones. Um, there was one term created in the last 15 years which is medical expulsive therapy. And medical expulsive therapy means um, it's a treatment, an additional supportive treatment with alpha blockers or calcium channel antagonists to facilitate the passage of a ureteral stone. And in the last 10 years, there were several systematic reviews, some of them 
very highly, in a very highly ranked journals um, published on this issue, and they were all very clear. I have just picked one, um, which was done by, by, by Christian Seitz from Vienna, um, published in 2009 in European Urology, 47 RCTs were included with alpha blockers or calcium channel blockers um, for stones up to 10 millimeters. And as you see, there was a significant effect for both, for alpha blockers and calcium channel blockers. And then, two years ago, um, the Urology Society was confused because there was a very um, good study published in The Lancet, um, multicentric, randomized, placebo-controlled, which is not the case for many of those other RCTs with more than a thousand patients. And what came out was nothing. Um, placebo was as effective as medical expulsive therapy, either with tamsulosine or, um, or calcium channel blockers. And um, there was no difference in terms of stone size. And there was no difference in terms of pain quality of life measured at the SF36. What you just keep in mind if we talk about size is that there was a substantial difference in the group with stones smaller than five millimeters and larger than five millimeters. So finally, compared to placebo, tamsulosine and nifedipine, which, which was used here, was not effective at all in decreasing the need for further treatment to achieve stone clearance in a four weeks um, period. And the question now was, after having implemented the recommendation of medical expulsive therapy in all our guidelines, um, how do we resolve this conflict of evidence? And it's important if you realize how evidence is produced. And that is a very interesting paper that was published in 1997 um, in the New England Journal. And what the authors did were they screened the literature to find um, huge systematic reviews that were followed by large RCTs on the same topic. And what they identified was one series of 12 large RCTs after 19 meta-analyses, so it's even a bigger complex of data than, than for medical expulsive therapy. And they figured out that the results of such RCTs on the same topic um, disagreed with the earlier published meta-analysis in um, up to 35%, which is, I think, quite a significant number. So the problem we often have is, um, if you follow the EBM classification, um, that meta-analysis systematic reviews have a higher level of, a higher level of evidence than a single RCT. Um, so if we have a meta-analysis that is based on poor quality RCTs, um, it has more impact on guidelines than a well-conducted RCT. And um, that is really difficult um, to be solved, and it makes sense in th this specific issue if you go into the systematic reviews, if you check which studies are included, and if you look at potential limitations of the study by sites that I um, just showed to you, you realize that most RCTs were really small, only a few with more than 100 patients. Most of them were single-centric, um, most of them had a low internal validity, and within the RCTs there was a high clinical heterogeneity in terms of the patient inclusion, stone location, stone size, and the treatment in the distinct group. And the ideal, what we would like to have if we produce systematic reviews, is um, to get raw data, however we often try, but we usually uh, do not succeed with this. On the other hand, the study by Picard in The Lancet had limitations as well, even though on the first side it was quite a perfect study. Um, one end point was the lack of intervention. Um, I believe that is a very imprecise surrogate parameter because um, sometimes the patient passed the stone, you just don't know if it was two days ago, three days ago, or if it's still there and he has just no symptoms. Um, there was no CT imaging in follow-up, and the secondary outcome in terms of pain was under Powered. So um, it's difficult, and um, there was a big discussion, especially between um, the old Europe and, and the UK, because the people from UK really tried to stop tamsulosine treatment, and uh, within the um, well mainland Europe, so to say, uh, it was more like, well, we have to figure out what is the difference. And interestingly, just end of the year, um, 
A new article was um, published online in European Urology from China. Um, again, same topic, tamsulosin, multicentric randomized double blind. Um, that was a study that was um, um, funded by, by a pharmaceutical company. Um, that is why they could do this effort um, placebo controlled. And interestingly, again, yeah, we ex again find um, an effect of tamsulosin. And what is important, I think, in this study is um, if you focus on the stone size, um, you had a clear effect for stones larger than five millimeters, but you had almost no effect for the small stones. And one explanation why um, the study of Picard and the Lancet could not demonstrate an effect, um, a beneficial effect of tamsulosin, was that most of the stones, you remember the numbers, um, were smaller than five millimeters. However, that is how we interpret this confusion. At the moment, um, Richard Sylvester, who did a lot of work in the EOTC, um, published a paper on the conflict of evidence, which is quite um, interesting if you are interested in this topic. So, what is now in the guidelines is patients with newly diagnosed small ureteral stones um, should be observed periodically. However, nobody knows how often is it enough if you see them once a, once a week or every two weeks, do you have to do ultrasound and lab tests? Do you have to do another x-ray or, or CT imaging? We don't know. I think that is um, open to the um, decision of the clinician. You have to offer patients appropriate medication. Appropriate medication is, of course, pain medication. I didn't mention this today. There are some gray zones as well, um, but at least a non steroidal antiphlogistic drug should be offered. And how it's about um, MET, if the patient is selected for spontaneous passage on MET, he should have well-controlled pain. I think that's clear, no signs of infection, sepsis, and an adequate um, kidney function. Um, offer patients, that is what is now, it's, it's less well strict than it was formulated in the past. Offer patients um, MET, um, in particular for stones in the lower part of the ureter with stones larger than five millimeters. Um, counsel the patient about potential um, side effects. Bernie has just said, um, it's, he has heard it's, it's dangerous because of the retrograde great ejaculation, but uh, he mentioned, and he was right, that is probably not the main problem when you have a colic. And, um, but you have to inform the patient, of course, that it's off-label. It will ever be off-label um, because um, the, it's, it's generic drug, so um, that is something you have to tell your patient and follow up, as I said, the patients regularly, um, whatever this means. So, that are some gray zones. I'm sure there are many others. Um, thank you for your attention, and I um, would be happy to discuss the gray, the black, and the light zones together with you. Thank you very much. So, the, this nice uh, presentation is open to questions. Thomas, I have a question on, uh, on uh, the um, composition of the stone. Uh, the guidelines do, do, does not uh, give any, any, any rule, any suggestion about uh, the, this topic. Yeah. Um, the, the stone composition was interestingly in the guidelines until 10 years or so, and um, it disappeared for some reason when, um, when Hans Gerwen Tiserius retired. Um, <laughs> so sometimes even guidelines and evidence is fixed to one person. Um, I don't know any evidence that spontaneous passages or passage rates differ between different stone compositions. But if we talk about conservative management, what we could of course discuss is the effect of chemolytolysis um, in radiolucent stones. And that comes to the next gray zone. How do we decide about a radiolucent stone if we do CTs? And um, it's not as easy as everybody thinks. You just measure Hounsfield units, and if it's 200 or 300, then it's a uric acid stone. Um, there are, again, many f factors that bring bias into this, like the stone size, um, mixed stones. Um, so what I realize often um, is that um, even me or my staff 
does a huge endoscopy, and then we, I, I sign the, the, the letter, and there's stone analysis, uric acid, and then I ask, well, have you counseled the patient about chemolytolysis? And usually nobody had, because nobody was aware that it's, um, it's a radiolucent stone. Um, I, I published a, a book with Peggy Pearl. Peggy said nobody does it in the US. Yeah, so, so I think that, that is the main issue, of course. And um, I think the calcium-containing stones are probably all the same in terms of conservative management. Infectious stones are, of course, not, but they come with different symptoms. Yeah. Thomas, a very nice point you made about the plethora of um, meta-analyses and evidence-based medicine. That was a very interesting point. But just your last slide, I'm just interested. Um, so I presume the purple are those that have endorsed the guidelines. Is that right? Who does? Your last slide yeah. here. Um, I'm the just purple one, yes, yes, yes. So yeah. I'm just interested, why, why, uh, why is North America and Canada or North America gray? I mean, is, that, is there a disagreement? Or, it's, or it's not a gray zone, so don't misunderstand me. Ah, okay. okay. <laughs> Uh, no, I, I think it's, it's, I mean, it's, the, the problem is political, I think, yeah, those are the AUA produces their own guidelines, we do, uh, we had some attempts to do it together, which makes more than sense, in my opinion, so, for example, the 2007 um, guideline on um, urethral stones, we did together, um, I think there were some further attempts, but, um, that is really something where we should work together. I mean, it, it makes, we, I think we all agree there's not much difference in terms of, of, of medical treatment between Europe and, and the US, and, and it doesn't make sense that everybody produces his own guidelines, but it's even worse, so our German society asked us as well for production of guidelines. So what we did was more or less a copy-paste um, translation um, from the European guideline into the German guideline, so it's, it's difficult. So, so I think celebritism probably does not bring us ahead. In <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for treating the, the topic. Yeah. Now, when would you uh, send uh, one of your patients where you find by uh, incident uh, stone to your preferred nephrologist? Uh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, I mean, if it's, if it's an inc incidental stone with a few millimeters, patient asymptomatic who never had a stone episode in the past, I believe there's no need for a nephrologist. There's not even a need for a urologist. Yeah? So I think it's, it's better to keep the patient out of <laughs> the reach of, of any doctor. Yeah? I mean, if it's, if it's a patient with recurrent stone formation, and we have those um, who had undergone several treatments, um, interventions with some residual stones of whatever composition, I think those patients have, of course, to undergo a further evaluation. Yeah. If uh, there isn't, there aren't any other questions, we can move on. Uh, 